Okay. There we go. All right, so um, announcement stuff, still working on the uh, getting the feedback back from the modeling reports. There's a miscommunication between me and the TA, and so he started grading some, and I started grading some. I have to go back and regrade his for consistency to give feedback, so I just hit that column while all that's being resorted. Um, and so, um, but otherwise, there's an ICA available. It's the last one before the final exam practice ICA, which is one where you can take multiple times and the highest grade is used and it sort of samples from all of the other uh, post midterm ICAs. The pre midterm one is available as this practice one uh, doesn't count for any credit. The post midterm one will be available uh, basically the exact same one as this. Once after it's due, then it'll be available until the exam. Uh, so you've got a chance to practice from those. Um, other resources on Canvas, again, there's example exams, extra problems, et cetera. So all that is available. Um, homework J2, the last homework is out. And uh, it's an arena-based homework. It's basically looking back at that Bucky's inventory management problem and making some modifications and finding some uh, optimal uh, strategies. You might want to use the process analyzer or OptQuest, which um, you think we introduce a little bit in lab 10, uh, but that's totally optional. It just might simplify some things. Uh, lab 10, sequence even batching and sim uh, So remember, it has 20 bonus points. That's like two thirds of a lab. So it's out of 50, or it's out of 30, but there's 50 points possible. You get uh, the, uh, the sequences might help if you've got some kind of complex layouts. Um, the bat, the, um, uh, as well as the batching, but, but in the batching, there's the signaling and holding, which is a very general purpose tool that definitely recommend you take a look at. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here. Part two um, also introduces the process analyzer and OptQuest, which is say, which might be helpful to simplify some of the work on the homework. Um, that is, if you're not comfortable with the process analyzer, it might be more work to use it than just manually doing the optimization. But if you feel comfortable with the process analyzer, uh, definitely can use that on the homework. And then after that, uh, all the other lab times are for uh, you to work with your final project. Uh, as I mentioned last time, lab 10 uh, technically is due this Sunday, but because it's got all the extra bonus credit, I've extended the availability window an to an additional Sunday. So you basically got a week and a half uh, to do lab 10 instead of just from Wednesday to Sunday. So there is extra time there, but I still made it due this Sunday just to give you encouragement to try to work on it uh, along in the normal timeline. Um, otherwise, um, final projects, uh, yeah, is your system sufficiently complex? What I mean by that is, um, does it warrant a sim? Can I answer this question? Do I already kind of know the answer to this question ahead of time before even running the sim? And if there's no ambiguity that you need the sim to help you resolve, it probably needs a little something else. It might be that your as-is system, if you're thinking about intervening, is really simple, just like a, a single channel queue or a single queue node, uh, but uh, your intervention um, is proposing something more complex that you really need a sim to understand. That's totally fine. Um, so, um, so just you know, is there simulation needed to gain insights either in the as is system or in your hypothetical system? Um, that's kind of the the, the key thing there. Um, I used to give this kind of heuristic, does it incorporate a sub model? But what, what we meant by that is uh, if you have a sufficiently complex kind of section of code in Arena, you can actually highlight it and create a sub model, which kind of hides it behind another entity. Um, not another entity, but another block so that it kind of hides that complexity away. And so we used to use that as kind of our litmus test. Like if it, if you could, if it makes sense to incorporate a sub model, it's probably complex enough. Uh, but really the big thing is, is regardless of whether it uses a sub model or not, do I really need SIM to gain any insights or is the SIM just demonstrating something that I already knew ahead of time? If it's already demonstrating something you knew ahead of time, you probably don't need the SIM. Um, and then, uh, and you know, is it, uh, you know, don't get too ambitious. So if the problem that you're um, working on, if you start noticing that you're adding and having all these extra details, then strip it back and say, you know what, 
uh, I only really need to focus on one particular thing. I can assume all these other things are constant or I can make some other sort of assumptions on them and sort of keep it simple. So what's the simplest problem that warrants simulation that you can try to solve? That's kind of what you want to focus on here. So the next deliverables are the last week of class. So the middle of the last week of class, you'll upload a 10 minute presentation um, that, uh, you know, at, that the, your team members should contribute to, but you shouldn't view it as like everybody has to speak for two and a half minutes or something like that. Um, it just has to be clear that everybody sort of had a part to play in the project. Um, but, you know, in a real, uh, you know, if we're doing this, in an industry, if we're giving a presentation, there's no reason to like balance the presentation out among the to the team. Some people are going to be better presenters than others, so so don't worry too much about that. But do worry about you know trying to uh, to keep it within ten minutes. Um, don't go over ten minutes, and uh, make it so that you answer sort of all the questions. And so it needs to kind of be concise and clear. Um, and so. Uh, it doesn't leave anybody wanting after 10 minutes. And so it might be that eight minutes will be enough for that. So you're not going to get penalized for time, but if you go over 10 minutes, it's possible that I will stop watching or the peer reviewers will stop watching. If you go under 10 minutes, it's possible you'll leave stuff out and I'll be like still wondering, asking a bunch of questions. And so 10 minutes is kind of a guideline, but definitely don't go over, but it's okay if you're under. Uh, presentation grades are part in part by peer review. Same thing with the reports. Reports has a very specific format posted on Canvas. It's four pages and they're looking for particular sections. So before you start writing your report, make sure you go to the final project uh, module and take a look at the requirements for that final report document. And then after you turn those in Wednesday, the middle of the last week of class, you'll have peer reviews. So everybody, every individual, so this isn't a group assignment, will be randomly assigned one presentation not from your group and one final report not from your group. And you'll do a peer review of each of those. And you'll probably get a presentation from one group and a, and a final report from another group. It'll be anonymous. Uh, of course, you'll see who they are, but they won't know where you are. Uh, but I'll review the reviews and I'll be able to give you your check on you leaving constructive feedback. All right, so any questions? about what's to come not a whole lot more grades left so if you're looking for extra work or whatever that extra credit on the lab 10 is sort of sort of it and then if you're looking to buffer your ica remember that ica m that's coming up uh you can take that as many times as you want it's also got a lot more points and so that's a good way to buffer that but the lowest seven icas are dropped anyway so Okay, um, so let's do a quick attendance exercise. So question is on the slide here. Uh, I am going to try to locate the, for some reason the chat on my main machine is gone. So normally I like to type the link into the chat, but I can't do that right now. So for those of you online, you'll just have to use the, um, type that in yourself or use the QR code. But the question is right there. Um, a point estimate is equivalent to what type of confidence interval? Is it a 0% confidence interval, 95%, 100%, um, or is it totally different? Is this like a red herring and a point estimate has nothing to do with confidence intervals? So go ahead and put what you think is the right answer there, A, B, C, or D. It's only one of those. Does anybody have any guesses as to what a what type of confidence interval a point estimate is? Anybody? C. So that's that's one uh, one option there. Um, how many people would say C? Okay, A is another. So how many people would say A? All right. So a little more hands for A. How many people would say B? Okay, there's a, there's a hand or two. And then how many people would say D? All right, so there's a little bit there. So I think the the, the mode here was, was um, A. I saw some votes for 100% online as well. Um, the, the tip that I would give you is that in a confidence interval, this percentage is how confident you are that you have included the right answer. And so the bigger the interval, the more confident you've included the right answer. So a point estimate is the smallest interval you can get to. So that's what I would call a 0% confidence interval A. So 
Um, it's 0% confidence because it just means that when I ran my experiment, that's the sample mean I got for my tiny little experiment. There's no guarantee that my experiment is a sample of all the experiments I could run. And my experiment might be a model of the real world, but could even be off from that. But, and so what I'm saying here is that, um, you know, a point estimate is just something that gives me a scope of inference of a single run of an experiment. Now, if we use a point estimate to generate an interval, then there's a possibility that the real average, not just the average that came out of one run, will be included. So the confidence here, the percentage is how confident are you that the real answer is in there? And a point estimate is just generated from one run of a sim. It might be close, but it's definitely not the real thing. And that's why we need the interval. So a point estimate is a 0% confidence interval. We have no confidence that it's right. All right, so second attendance question. So um, the same one here. So those online, again, I'm not going to be able to put the link in the chat, uh, but it is up here online. So in this second one here, assuming similar estimates of standard deviation across the three confidence intervals CIs below, which confidence interval corresponds to the largest number of samples? So try to remember what happens to confidence intervals as you take more samples in your experiments. A, B, or C. So I'll give you a second to put down this for your second attendance question today. Okay, so how many people would say it is A? How many people would say B? More hands. How many people would say C? All right, so in the class, um, pretty much got all B. Um, not, not a response online for this one, then that's what I would say B as well. B is the narrowest. So taking more data shrinks our confidence intervals, or in other words, excludes more possibilities uh, for what the answer actually is in the kind of global system. So if we run multiple replications of an experiment, Sometimes the point estimate is here, sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over here, and so on. Um, so, um, and so what we're sort of saying here is we want to run experiment and it has lots of replications, then it's likely that its point estimate will be much closer to the real world value. You run that experiment again with that many replications, and it's not going to give you the same point estimate, but it probably will also be close to the previous point estimate. But if we only run a couple of replications, very few replications, then we really sort of are back, like we, we can't really anchor down um, where the real uh, estimate or the real population parameter is. And so it ends up being much larger. So more data, more replications gives you tighter confidence intervals. All right, so uh, all of that together, you know, the, the math behind it is here. It's all about the t-test. So confidence intervals, there are confidence intervals based on other tests, but the generic confidence interval that we talk about is all based on a t-test. And so we know the formula for doing a t-test by hand. We can turn this condition, which basically is when to reject a hypothesis. So if your hypothesis is theta and X bar is the mean you've got from experiments, and S is an estimate you have of the standard deviation from experiments, this condition, which is when you do reject the hypothesis, is equivalent to this condition, which means the hypothesis is outside of the confidence interval. So the confidence interval represents all hypotheses a t-test would fail to reject. And so if you're outside the interval, that corresponds to P less than alpha. If you're inside the interval, that corresponds to P greater than or equal to alpha. It summarizes a continuum of t-tests all at once. So um, with that, you know, if uh, the confidence interval does not include the mean, then the hypothesis is rejected. Um, and um, another way to kind of view these confidence intervals is the probability that the real population parameter is in the confidence interval is equal to the confidence level. So a 95% confidence interval means that if you give me one confidence interval, there's a 95% chance it includes the real value. So I did this example last time where um, if I run, um, I've got data here taken from 
the same distribution. So you can think about this as uh, an experiment run with either 20 samples, 200 samples, or 2,000 samples. Um, the same alpha is used to generate these confidence intervals. So these are all 95% confidence intervals. And so in all three cases, the 20 sample case, the 200 sample case, and the 2,000 sample case, roughly 90% of the confidence intervals include the real mean, which is five in this experiment. But the ones with fewer samples have wider confidence intervals. So it's hard if, if I run just one of these experiments, um, I've got a much wider range that the real mean might be in. But I would gather more data than even though the confidence intervals have wiggle around a little bit, they, um, they don't move that far from the mean. So that's one thing. The other thing that changes the confidence interval width is the fundamental variance um, in the data. And so as I take the same number of samples, 30, 30, and 30, but here I've got uh, less variance, um, intermediate variance, more variance, the confidence intervals get bigger. So as I run my experiment, if every replication is farther from each other, then I get a lot more variance and that's gonna make my confidence interval a lot bigger. So uh, what I, I you, you would think that I usually can't control variance, but as we'll see moving into the next unit, we can actually modify the experiment with things like blocking so that even though the fundamental system has got so many units of variance, if we design the experiment right, we can strip out a lot of those sources of variance. So all we're left over with is, is less variance, which will make our confidence intervals tighter. This is why I wanna stress the confidence intervals are partly, uh, their width is due partly due to samples and partly due to variance. All right, any questions about that? All right, I saw a late B answer on the chat too. So that's what we were looking for. Okay, so um, another example of this. So this is taken from a paper from a colleague. Um, and the actual data, what it means here doesn't matter that much. This is a colleague who happens to study um, how, um, uh, the, the, how ant colonies breed. And so uh, you can actually study the carbon dioxide generated by an ant colony. And um, you can use that to infer the metabolic rate, how many joules of energy the ant colony is using per unit time. So it's like the number of watts burned by an ant colony. And you can study um, the, you can take the mass of the ant colony. In this case, the, this is log scaled. So log the version of the mass and log version of the metabolic rate. And there are fundamental theories from biology that suggest that as things scale, that the, the metabolic rate is going to scale with a three-fourths power law. So if you double something's mass, you don't double how much energy it burns. Um, you, it, it sort of follows this what we call hypometric uh, scaling line. And when you put them on a log scale, log log plot, it ends up becoming a straight line. And so this paper not only sort of starts to demonstrate that it also works for colonies of insects, not just individual animals, but um, the question was, is the scaling exponent three fourths, which, as the theory would suggest? So what they did is they had a bunch of colonies that they measured how much carbon dioxide was produced by the colony and they're able to infer the metabolic rate. And that's what each one of these points are as a colony. And then they fit this nice line to it. And this is the best fit line here. But in reality, whenever you get a regression coefficient, that's a point estimate. And you always put confidence intervals around regression coefficients. So regression coefficients themselves need confidence intervals. And that's what they report down here. They said, the best fit was a scaling relationship to the 0.78 power, and then in parentheses in their paper, 95% confidence interval of 0.67 to 0.898. And so they then go even further to say, well, let, now we're going to look just at that confidence interval. This scaling exponent is statistically less than one. What do they mean by that? They mean that one is outside of the confidence interval. So we're going to reject the hypothesis of linear scaling. But then they go on to say, and not statistically different from 0.75, which is what the theory would predict. And so they're saying that 0.75 is inside the confidence interval. So <clears throat> in just by showing me a confidence interval, you're doing two types of hypothesis tests. You're rejecting one null hypothesis of linear scaling, 
and you're providing support for another theoretical hypothesis. So, you know, all within one confidence interval. This is the reason why we present confidence intervals because the, the interval itself tells us so much about what's in the interval and what's out of the interval. So that's a way we can do that. So any questions about this example that you show a confidence interval and that can simultaneously um, provide some evidence that something might be inside the confidence interval and thus supported by the data and outside the confidence interval and thus rejected by the data simultaneously. And you do the same thing with your sims. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so in this case, this is all the same species. And I think in these experiments, they were lab colonies. So all of that was controlled for. So good question. That's one of the things we can do to reduce variance because those other things would end up creating a lot more variance. And so by keeping them all the same, it reduces the variance, which helps us reduce the confidence intervals. Because without that, this confidence interval would be gigantic and probably include both 1.0 and 0.75 in it and wouldn't be useful at all. Um, likewise, there are statistical ways that if you did do a field, uh, and people do this, um, uh, you can do field metabolic measurements. And in those cases, you can put in all of those other things as extra data and then use something like what we're going to talk about next week called control variance to factor off all of that extra variance that you've controlled for. So we'll get to that. Okay, any other questions about this example? All right, the other example we have here um, so this is from uh, some more genetic analysis. Um, and uh, and so, <clears throat> again, it doesn't matter what these data are right now, but these are all regression coefficients. So again, um, regression coefficients themselves get confidence intervals. They're not, you don't just fit a best fit line and say the line is it. The slope of that line is a point estimate. So there are many slopes that it could possibly be. If you took other sets of data, you get a different best fit line. So the best, we need to kind of get a confidence interval around best fit lines. And that's what um, what's here. And so we know that if a best fit line, a linear regression line has a zero slope, then that means there's no relationship between the two uh, factors here. And so um, here, this is saying these are our independent variables, and these is our dependent variable, response variable, and these are the regression coefficients. So this is the best fit regression coefficient here um, for when you're regressing one thing on the other. So when you take this as your independent, your x-axis, and this is your y-axis. And what he didn't even report p-values. What he said is, I'm just reported 95% confidence intervals, and then has a little asterisk here that says, oh, by the way, look, these confidence intervals do not include zero. Well, you got to know what that, when you're, when you read data papers, you have to know what that means. And that's Tim, Tim Linksvayer's way of saying p is less than 0.05, where the asterisks are. Because what he's saying here is that this confidence interval includes zero, which means there's a possibility that there is zero relationship, that there's a zero regression coefficient between this independent variable and this dependent variable. But for all three of the rest of these, these confidence intervals are all bounded away from zero. So that means with 95% certainty, there is a relationship between these three things and that output there. And you don't have to even include a p-value. If you put the confidence interval in there and it doesn't include zero or whatever your null hypothesis would project, then that's enough. So that tells me there's a significant relationship. So any questions about that? This merging what we know about confidence intervals and regression lines. This is also what it means when you do a linear regression and jump or whatever software program you said spits out P less than 0.05. What it means is it fit the regression coefficient and internally it calculated the coefficient on the regression coefficient and that internal co uh, confidence interval did not include zero. Okay. Um, so 
if um, one sample confidence intervals are disjoint, so this is going, we're trying to get to the relative comparison, comparing two populations together. And so if you calculate a one sample confidence interval for population X and another one sample confidence interval for population Y, and they don't intersect, so they're disjoint. So here's X's confidence interval, Y's confidence interval, the intersection is empty. Then we can conclude that these two populations have a different mean. So we can conclude P is less than 0.05 if these were 95% confidence intervals. But if they do have an intersection, so there are points shared between them, then we can't conclude anything. We actually have to run a two sample t-test. So it's great when you summarize data with a, two, with a uh, confidence intervals, because when there's only two groups, you can very quickly see if there's significant differences but if there aren't if there possibly aren't significant differences you still have to resort to tests but uh, that's just but another reason why um, it's still valuable to try to summarize things with confidence intervals so that's sort of example here this is a 95 percent confidence interval for hiv detection method a here's another confidence interval for detection b these are days until detection so they're trying to test whether one detection method is faster than the other and in this particular case, um, the confidence intervals um, overlapped. So we had to run a two sample t test and it calculated a p value of less than 0.05. So even though the confidence intervals overlapped pretty significantly or pretty appreciably, then uh, still they had a significant difference. So when they overlap, you can't conclude that they're not different. But when they don't overlap, without even running the test, you can conclude p less than 0.05. So if this interval was far less than this interval, so there was a gap between them. You don't even have to run the test. So that's one of the values of a 95% confidence interval. All right. So any questions about these one sample uh, extrapolations to two sample tests? And this is real common in your data because um, you will run a model in your sim and then you'll run your intervention or whatever, your alternative model, and you'll look at the confidence intervals on customer waiting time. And you could go and do a two sample t-test, but if this confidence interval on the as-is model is significantly greater or is like doesn't overlap the confidence interval on your intervention model, then you just have to tell me that. Look, the confidence intervals don't overlap, so my model is better than the as-is model without even doing a t-test. So that's like... You know, because, you know, ARENA gives you 95% confidence intervals, you can use them to prevent you from having to do the test. Okay. All right, so uh, what we're trying to get to today is, um, is, the, is other ways to do more sophisticated two-sample tests. Because when you're comparing A to B, um, that's not a one-sample problem, really. That's a two-sample problem. You know, are these two populations the same or different? And what we're going to develop today is something analogous to the one sample confidence interval for two sample tests. And what that's going to be is a confidence interval on differences. So uh, we've already kind of seen this with the, the paired t-test, like rather than having a confidence interval on X, and a confidence interval on Y, and then asking, do these confidence intervals overlap? After we run experimental data, can we summarize our results with a confidence interval on the difference X minus Y? So it'll be a single confidence interval representing differences. And if we can, then if that confidence interval includes zero, then that means that we can't conclude anything about the differences between these two. But if that confidence interval doesn't include zero, this is kind of like the regression example, we can then include conclude that one population is significantly greater than the other in, on the mean. So that's what we're sort of developing now, a two sample version of a one sample test. That's what we're gonna get to today. All right, but um, before we get there, let's just a quick review of when we run SIMS, how do we gather the data? This is the stuff from the last two lectures. Um, so for transient simulations, which are what we use for terminating systems, uh, we need to just figure out how many replications to run. If someone says you have to give, um, you know, with 80% power, be able to find differences at least as big as epsilon, then you have to do a power analysis. And that's similar to what you did on homework G3. Uh, but um, it's often more convenient for someone to instead say, I want you to give me an interval estimate out of your SIM 
And I don't want your confidence interval to be any bigger or have a half width any bigger than epsilon. That's another way of giving me kind of a, a bound on sensitivity. And that's somewhat simpler to do. And that's like what you did in lab nine. And so um, I just sort of say, I don't want my half width to be more than half a unit or something like that. And what you do with that is you say, all right, I'm gonna take your bound on this, you know, you want the half width to be less than half a unit or something. And I've got this formula over here, which allows me to map this uh, variance that I estimate, I run a couple of samples, I was like, I'm going to run five samples of my simulation to get an estimated variance out of my system. And then I'm going to map it to this bound on the number of replications I need for the epsilon that you asked for. And so if I ran five replications and this formula suggests that the lower bound is actually 15, then I'm going to run 10 more replications. I take all 15 of those and put them into my analysis. And hopefully that confidence interval has a half width less than epsilon. So any questions about that? Again, you got practice with this in lab nine, just a way of taking an epsilon um, upper bound on half width and turning it into a number of replications just by algebraically manipulating the half width formula. Okay, so when you, so don't, so a lot of times I've got questions, how many replications of my sim do I need to run? That's the same as saying, how many replications of my experiment do I need to run? And the way you do that is run a pilot to get an estimate of your variance, then ask yourself, what's the, what's the, the bound on, like, if, it, if, if there was a difference less than this, I wouldn't care about it. Find that bound, and then you can answer the question for yourself about how many replications you need to run. Um, because if anything's less than at epsilon, it's effectively equivalent. Anything greater than, you're glad that you uh, found it. And so the smaller you make your epsilon, the larger the number of replications will need to be. Okay. All right, so then the other thing that we talked about last time was, well, what about steady state? So in steady state simulations, we run these um, for non-terminating systems. We start a simulation off, and it's going to start off in the wrong spot out of steady state. So it has a transient period that we want you to throw away. And we'd like to minimize the size of that transient period so we don't have to spend a lot of time using this, uh, doing these, this warm up period. And then we have to figure out how long to actually run this thing. And so we talked about um, initial, uh, intelligent initialization. So let's use real world data or mathematical models to try to initialize the system so that we're putting people in the queues, we're breaking the machines down ahead of time and so on. So things are more like the steady state system at first, uh, or we decide how much to truncate. And then once we know how much of those things, then we then have to ask how many replicates we need to run. And if we need to run a lot of replicates, we have the extra benefit in steady state simulations that we can actually make the execution time longer. So let's do a quick review of that. And then I wanna introduce batch means before we get on to relative performance estimation. So um, I said, you know, if we've used, assuming we've done um, as much uh, initialization bias here. Uh, so we're, we're talking about, um, the, so the point that we're trying to get here is that if you've decided that you want to get rid of a particular amount of data up front, T naught or D if it's discrete, then you the rule of thumb, or the, I hate to use that term, but the, the, the general rule that we use is you want to collect at least 10 times as much data um, as the data you've thrown away. So if you've thrown away an hour's worth of simulation data, you want to have 10 hours more than that left over to do your estimate. So that's just a, you know, generally there's no good reason for it. It just tends to work. So that's how you're going to pick. So per replication, you throw away T naught using methods we're about to review, and then you run it for T epsilon. And then um, you, uh, or matter of using methods that we talked about last time. And then once you've decided on that, you'll be able to estimate variance between your runs. And that's gonna help you decide how many replications to use. So once I know how long each run is, then I can estimate the variance with that run, plug it into the formula we just went over for transient simulations. And that gives me a number of replications that I need 
to meet my goals for the experiment. If that number is 25 or less, you just run that amount. If that number is greater than 25, then instead, we the extra replications that we would run above 25, we instead put in to extending the length of each of those 25 replications. And we do that with this little formula here. So if R0, let's say, is 25, it's the 25 replications that we've already run, or let's say R0 is uh, the, whatever the, the small number of replications that generate our pilot data, and R is the number of replications we ideally would like, rather than running our replications we can extend the initialization period by this ratio and we can extend the total time of the simulation by the same ratio and that extends the initialization phase thereby reducing variance or reducing bias even more and then it extends the data collection phase and that will tend to reduce variance because by collecting more data within the sim then you're going to it's kind of like if you're if this is like 100 customers and now you've got 150 customers when you average over those 150 customers you'll get a uh, less variance out of each replication for whatever that performance parameter is let's say it's the average time in the system so if you need a lot of extra runs with steady state simulations it sometimes will be better to just extend the length of the runs as opposed to adding more runs and that's what we're kind of talking about here. Now, the um, alternative that we didn't get to last time is batch means. And this is something that Arena will try to do automatically for you if your run is long enough. So the downside of running replications of steady state simulations is that the warm-up period here has to be thrown away for every replication. So if you've got 25 replications, if each one of these warm-up periods takes let's say three minutes to run before it starts actually collecting data, then that's 25 times three minutes. That's a significant amount of time you've just wasted in just warming up your simulation to get rid of your bias. So the other thought was, well, instead of paying that cost 25 times, is there a way I can run this steady state simulation so long that I only pay the warm-up cost once? And so the idea here is that I could then create these batches. So I run the warm-up period for three simulated minutes. And then let's say I run the steady state simulation for two simulated days. And then the next study, then, and then another two simulated days, and then another two simulated days. So that I end up getting whatever 30 day, 30 simulated days or something like that. Now, if I've chosen the length of these little batches long enough then it's going to be that the performance estimate from one batch will not correlate to the performance estimate of the next batch. And that's going to effectively mean that one replication of my simulation will generate 25 outputs or 15 outputs or whatever I said. So I said, like, let's say I'm doing two days per batch and I simulate 30 days of collected data. Well, so that's 15 independent replications out of one replication so i ran the experiment once i paid the warm-up cost once and then because it's so long it automatically gets chopped up in arena so that it generates 15 samples for one sample and this is what happens when you run arena and it generates confidence intervals for you even though you only ran one replication is if you're paying attention, then it's like, well, why, how could I generate a confidence interval when I only ran one replication? Well, the way it does that is if you're, if it's long enough, Arena can detect whether it can generate independent batches and it will choose the batch size automatically. Behind the scenes, it will do this chopping up process. It'll generate outputs that are independent outputs and it'll generate a confidence interval across those independent outputs. So that's what happens when you get a confidence interval when you only run one replication. If instead you run Arena for one replication and it says like, um, you know, uh, uh, correlated data or something like that, instead of, I forget what the term that they use and the reports are, but if the report fails to generate a confidence interval, that's because your, your one replication wasn't long enough for it to do this. So every sub-interval it tried was correlated with all the other sub-intervals and so it couldn't generate those uh, those confidence intervals. So 
that's a really nice way to generate a lot of these data um, if you're willing to run one giant long replication. But it's dangerous to do um, because you might introduce autocorrelation if you're not careful. So it might be that each uh, that this replication predicts the average from this replication and so on. So that's what we mean by baffles. So any questions about that? And that's what's going on behind the scenes in Arena when you run one rep and it still generates a confidence interval. Okay. Now, if you wanted to manually generate your own batches afterwards, you can do that doing the same technique that Arena does. And Arena even gives you the tools to help with that. So in the output analyzer, uh, there is a correlogram that you can run. Um, it's one of the tools, I think, under Analyze. You can feed it a single time series from a single replication, and it generates effectively an autocorrelation analysis. It looks at every time point, and then it looks at so many lags after that time point and sees that they're co correlated. So that generates an, a sort of a, an, an X variable and a Y variable. So that window as it slides along allows you to plot that and generate, see if there's any correlation at that distance. And it plots the correlation values for all of those separations. And so we see when there's very little separation, there's high correlation. As you get more separation, the correlation goes down. And eventually it could go to negative correlation, but that still counts as correlation. But eventually, way out here, it's pretty darn low. So there are, are in, like nodes where it goes to zero, but it still stays significant basically out here. And so um, what we're looking for is what is the lag, the interval, where the correlation finally drops off. You can do this in other tools like MATLAB. So here's MATLAB's correlogram. And MATLAB's nice enough that you can actually give it a significance level, and it plots um, these little fences here to show you uh, where uh, the the level of significance goes. So basically where the correlation coefficients become insignificant. And when I look at this, I see that I really don't get totally inside the blue lines until, I don't know, somewhere over here. And so I might conclude that my correlation length is a term we might use for it is, you know, something like, I don't know, 90 or something like that. And so, or even a hundred. And so that's what I'm saying is I need to wait a hundred time units until I can be confident that the next data points are independent of the previous data points. And so that's how we come up with these correlation links, but then we also then try to increase them just to be safe. So in this example below, let's say I concluded that 20 was my correlation length, and that's probably, I might conservatively maybe set it over here, but let's say you set it to 20, then I would choose roughly 10 times as that, and I'd choose a batch size of about 200. So this is a way in which you can choose these batch sizes. And then I would then run my SIM for like 20,000 and every 200, I would treat like a new replication. And that's how I generate batches manually. So any questions about that, about what batches are and how to figure out your batch size? Okay. All right, so let's flip to some slightly new things, but it's kind of just a modification of what we've already seen. We've talked about estimating absolute performance of individual systems, but most of the stuff we do, especially in a final project, um, is gonna depend not on absolute numbers where your SIMs have to be really precise, but relative differences. And that helps give us qualitative understanding of how one system might or might not be different than another system. And so um, the idea here is, like I said, we're going to try to develop this idea of a confidence interval on differences as opposed to two confidence intervals to compare to each other. So the idea, the, the basic conceptual model that we're kind of coming up with here, the sort of model system here, is imagine a calling center that is simulated by system one or system two. Imagine system one is the as-is system. Callers come in. They uh, choose what you know what they need, billing or tech support. 41% of them go to billing where there's three operators waiting to help them. The other 59% go to tech support where there's four operators waiting to help them. And then they exit the system. So for this model one, for this system one here, um, we could run a certain number of replications and for each one of them calculate like the waiting time for each caller. And then for that system one, we would get a sample mean and a sample variance. 
Now your boss comes to you and says, I'm interested in cross training. I would like to have my, our seven operators here all be able to do both billing and support because I've noticed that it seems like our wait times for support are very different than our wait times for billing. So maybe one of them is more idle than another. And so if I just merge them together, then maybe people overall will wait less time. So I'd like to study the impact of cross-training, and that's what they're doing here. So I generate this system where they're all cross-trained, and there's no switching here um, so that we've got these seven operators here. And I want to compare these two systems to see if they're any better. So um, I would like to know what's the difference in performance between these two systems and generate some sort of confidence interval on differences. and. So that's this is sort of what the confidence interval on differences would look like. This is the mean difference here. This is the standard error of the mean. This is my critical T value. Every confidence interval has this shape, whether it's a two sample confidence interval or a one sample confidence interval. It always looks like this the mean, the standard error of the mean, and the T value. If that confidence interval is bounded away from zero, I can conclude that this system as a mean, system one's mean is significantly less. Than system two's mean. If it's bounded away from zero on the other side, I conclude that system one's mean is significantly greater than system two's mean. If it's in the middle, I can't tell any difference based on this experiment. So that might mean that I have to take more samples to really understand what the difference is. Because at this point, I can't exclude the possibility that they actually behave roughly the same. So I just need to build this two sample confidence interval to summarize what I would do in a two sample test, because it's much nicer to present two confidence intervals to people than key values on t-test. And because it summarizes how different the systems are. So, um, but how do we calculate the things that we need, that we need here? The difference in means is easy. I just calculate the mean of uh, one set of samples, the mean of the other, subtract them, and I have my, my mean differences. But how do I choose the degrees of freedom that goes in my critical T value in the standard error formula? Well, it turns out it depends on how I set up the experiment. You've already seen in homework G3 that if you set up the experiment as a paired difference T test, that, um, that there's one way to solve this. But if I don't pair up things like I did on homework G3, if I run them independently, so I run system one with one set of customers and system two with a totally different set of customers, then I can't use the paired difference t-test using a homework G3. I have to use a true two sample t-test. But it turns out there's two, at least two different ways for me to run two sample t-tests based on how different the variance is of these two systems. So I either can pull these systems together or separate them out. So that's what we're gonna go through here. So the, um, the first one, this is like your homework G3. Um, I can set up blocking where I run the same customers in to both systems. And in which case I always have the same number of replications of every system. So the, the first the replication is always gonna use the same customers. So that output gets blocked together, the second one and so on and so forth. So there, if I study the, the variance between the two systems of the difference here, just basic probability theory tells me the variance of differences is the sum of the variances minus uh, two times their covariance. So their covariance is how much they're correlated together. And when I look at that, that's broken down into this here, that's just the variance I would get from studying system one, the variance I get from studying system two. And then this thing is nice because it's saying here that if the two systems are correlated, the variance in their difference will be less than the, the basically the sum of their two variances. And so, um, so the idea that we're saying here is if you get really difficult customers into system one, and they're also difficult to, to system two, or really easy customers for system one, and they're also easy for system two, if there's correlation so that for the same inputs, you get like for the same patterns on the output, then what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow us to subtract off a source of variance. So the variance in the differences will be less than the sum of the variance of the individual systems. That's what makes statistical blocking work. That's what makes this approach work. So when you have an opportunity to do this, when you think 
that the a, a difficult input for one system will also be difficult for another, you should do this. And so when you do that, um, you end up having to not calculate a two sample t test, but create differences per replication. So replication of system one, replication of system two, they have the same inputs, subtract them, get a difference for replication one, do that for all the replications, just like you did for homework G3. From that difference, calculate a variance. From that variance, calculate a standard error of the mean. And the degrees of freedom for this one's easy because it's just R minus one. It's just the number of replications minus one. And so with that, I have enough info that I can calculate a confidence interval. And I test to see if that confidence interval includes zero. And that's effectively a paired difference t-test. But we can present it as a nice confidence interval, which is much more informative than just presenting a p-value. All right, so that's what you did in homework G3. Any questions about that, about the idea of why we use blocking to reduce variance and thereby tighten confidence intervals? Okay. So now let's get into something more exotic. So you got two systems, system one and system two. They did not have the same customers going into them. But if we look at the outputs, we can see that, or we can assume for some reason, that the outputs have the same magnitude variance between the two systems. So if I estimate the variance of one system, uh, I can use uh, an F-test or something like that in order to show that the variance in the other system is similar. So, um, so if I show that these two systems have similar variance, then I can actually get a better estimate of what that variance is by pooling all the data together. So, um, so that's what the so-called pooled variance uh, t or two sample t test is about here, is that I'm just um, lumping all of these variances together, pooled variance up here, um, so that even though I've got maybe 10 samples of system one and 10 samples of system two, I'll use the 10 and the 10 to test their differences but to estimate their variance, I'll use all 20 data together. And that's what we're using here. So how do we do that? Well, I've got my estimated variance for system one, and my estimated variance for system two. This is my estimated variance that I'm assuming is the same for both systems. And it's just this kind of formula here, which if you really think about it, is a kind of a weighted combination of the amount of data I got from system one. So you notice it gets multiplied by these number of reps, the degrees of freedom that is, and um, also for system two. So this gets scaled by the R1 minus one degrees of freedom from system one, this from the R minus two from system two, the whole thing's divided by the total degrees of freedom between the two systems. So my total degrees of freedom is an easy expression. It's just the number of samples from one plus the number of samples of two minus two, two because I had to estimate a mean uh, for this system and I had to estimate a mean for that system. And that got rid of two degrees of freedom. So this is, a so now I have these two, I can now calculate a standard error of the mean, and um, that standard error of the mean formula for pooled variance is just this estimate of standard deviation times this little um, function here, which deals with the number of replications. So um, as I increase the number of replications, the standard error goes down and the confidence interval goes down. So this is nice, because this formula is not so bad. This formula is not so bad. This is a little ugly, but it's kind of understandable. Um, I plug that all in to my stand, my, my, uh, and I can now get um, a, a two sample uh, confidence interval using that same formula we had a couple of slides ago, the generic formula for this. This is more powerful than unequal variance methods like we're about to see, um, especially for low sample sizes. But we have to be able to assume that the two systems have the same variance. If one system doesn't move that much and the other system's output's moving around a whole lot, I cannot use this. But if I can assume that one system and the other system, there's no reason to believe they have different variants, this is more powerful and thus the better test. Now, in the most generic case, um, I, when I can't assume the two systems have the same variance, I have to use the Welch's unequal variance t-test. This is another two sample t-test, but it is for systems where we can't assume they have the same variance between the two systems. And so, here, here's the generic formula for the standard error of the mean. Um, it sort of expands to this. If um, I assume some replications are also independent, then the variance for each system is this formula down here. Combining all of this stuff, I get a straightforward standard error expression where the standard error of this um, of these, these guys here, 
is just this formula here, which looks pretty innocuous, pretty easy. Like, so we're saying that's how we get the standard error of the mean when we're using unequal variance. It just kind of looks like the square root of the sum of the variances. It kind of makes sense. But the problem with this test is the expression for degrees of freedom. It is super ugly. And it's because the degrees of freedom, when you do these unequal variants, it just, it, I, I don't have a great way to explain to you. I can explain the degrees of freedom in the two other tests. This one is a lot uglier and a lot more conditional. And so it's more difficult for me to explain to you how you get this degrees of freedom. But that is the ugly formula. This is the floor function, rounds down to the nearest integer. Um, and you can plug all those things in. It's not that bad. It's just kind of uglier to look at. Um, but when we know that degrees of freedom and that standard error of the mean, we can now plug that in. We can use get our critical T value from this. We can scale the standard error by that. And now we've got our confidence interval. This um, is fine, but it is lower power, um, but it performs well when you have enough data. And enough data means you need to have at least six samples of both systems. So if you really can't tell that the two systems have the same variance, you have to use this, but you really need at least six replicates each to be able to use it. And those are our three um, two sample t tests. So to summarize all that together, um, in all three cases, I gave you a different formula for standard error and a different formula for degrees of freedom. Everything else is the same. You can take your sample mean from one system, subtract the sample mean from the other system. That's the center of your confidence interval. And then you take the degrees of freedom expression from however you set the system up. Did I pair them together? Can I, if I didn't pair them together, can I count on them having equal variance? If I didn't pair them and I can't count them on an equal variance, then the unequal variance. So you plug in the appropriate degrees of freedom and the appropriate standard error, and you get a confidence interval. And for all three tests, you then present, you compare it to zero. See, that's the beauty of this. I can now present this to somebody and I don't have to tell them what test I used or what the p-value was. I can say, trust me that I used the right test. And if you want to know, it's in the appendix. But the confidence interval on the two sample tests that I use, the right one that I use, that I'm not gonna bother you with, is this simple confidence interval down here. And hey, that simple confidence interval is bounded away from zero. So these two systems are different. My proposed intervention is so much better than the as-is system, summarized by that confidence interval right there visually. It is so much better to present your data this way than to say, I used a Welch's uh, unequal variance t-test and my p-value is less than 0.03, and so x is better than y. Nobody knows what that means, right? Very few people will be able to buy that. But if I say, I used a two sample t test and the confidence interval on their difference was somewhere between 0.5 and 1.5. Then you can say, aha, x is better than y. And not only is x better than y, x is at least 0.5 better than y and might even be as much as 1.5 better than y. That's why it's better to do this. So any questions about that? The reason why we're, you know, we're, we're getting more and more rid of point estimates, even for differences, and everything's confidence intervals. Even when we're talking about relative differences, it's a confidence interval on the differences. Just depending on how you set your experiment up, you might change how you calculate that confidence interval. Okay, good. All right, so um, last couple of things here. Um, this is about relative uh, systems or relative performance. We've talked about two systems. How do we generalize this to more than two systems? So I've got three or more opportunities, like I've got system A, system B, and system C. For example, um, you, you show your boss the results from comparing the non, you know, the separate billing and support to the cross-trained. And it turns out that maybe you can, you can really improve performance with, um, with the cross-training. Great. So much so that your jerk boss says, well, maybe we can lay off one of the operators. That way I don't have to pay as much per hour and I can get the same performance. So go and do that hypothetical for me. What if we have six operators working instead of seven? How is that going to affect performance? So now I want to compare system A, system B, and system C together and see which system is best or are two systems effectively the same? How do I do that? I've only talked about how to do this for two systems, not three. 
All right, so um, this falls into what we refer to as ranking and selection or RNS. And so we need to, in a statistically rig rigorous way, do RNS, do ranking and selection, compare all these models to each other, maybe put them in order, but definitely select the best. And so one of the things we can do is do pairwise comparisons. So how does A compare to B? How does A compare to C? How does B compare to C? And so with those three comparisons, can I end up setting up sort of an ordering there? And I can do, so I know how to do pairwise comparisons. The whole rest of this lecture was about pairwise comparisons. You know how to do two sample t-tests. So now you can do three two sample t-tests and maybe that's great. Um, but um, the, the problem with that is every time you do another t-test on the same population or the same sort of family, um, then you, you might, you run into the false positive rate issue. It's like you might accidentally detect that A is greater than B and then when A is not, and then B is greater than C, well, now you're going to conclude maybe that A is greater than C. So it may not, you know, work out. So what we need to do is Bonferroni correction, for example. And so um, we might need to um, count the number of comparisons and then adjust our alpha for each pairwise comparison to correct for that. So that's what I'm kind of talking about here. So each pairwise comparison has its own FPR, its own alpha. The probability of detecting and ordering among equally performing uh, models will be much higher than the pairwise FPR. So we would like the probability of detecting and ordering, given that systems are equivalent, that FPR to be alpha, and all the other alphas are going to be a lot lower than that. So how do we do that? Is we count how many comparisons we need to do the ordering, and then each individual pairwise comparison, we divide its alpha by that number, that number of comparisons. And I already talked about this in a previous lecture, this way of Bonferroni correcting tests based on number of comparisons. So that's one way to do it. But if you have a huge number of comparisons, the alpha for each one of your um, your your um, each one of your pairwise comparisons is going to be really low, to the point where you're probably not going to detect the difference. So in Arena, we can actually do we can go into one way ANOVA, pull in three data sets, and then we can say I want you to after you've found that there's a difference using your ANOVA, I want you to figure out rank and select them. And so how do you want me to do that? Well, under comparison method, you can select Bonferroni and it will do this. It will say, well, I need to do, uh, you know, three uh, comparisons, or I might need to do however many comparisons, and it will take whatever your confidence level is and automatically apply the right correction. The downside of that is if you have a very um, high number of comparisons, you'll get very little statistical power because each individual pairwise test will basically never reject you know, the alpha will be like close to zero. So we need another way to do that. And so as you go on to take a little more sophisticated stats classes, you'll start learning about what are called post hoc tests. And so you can run your ANOVA that you already know about from like 380. And your ANOVA would say, I've got five systems here. And I detected that the change from system A to system B to system C to system D or whatever, A from, does have a difference in performance here. Well, what a post hoc test does, in this case, I'm showing the Tukey test, which is often used in science. In engineering, we often use Fisher's LSD um, down here. It has, um, it's a little bit um, less conservative. The Tukey test is a little more conservative. And notice on the ANOVA here, there's little, there's little letters, A, 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 B, B, B. Those letters give you groups of things that are statistically different, uh, or um, not able to be telling a difference apart. So this is saying that these two groups, it can't tell a difference apart from them to the significance level you gave. Um, a and A are, are too different. It also can't tell these two groups from this group, A, B. So if they include a letter, it can't tell them apart. But it does say that these two that are labeled B, they are significantly different from these two down here. But these two, it can't tell the difference with this one. So this one's like really ambiguous. It's not clear whether it's in group A or group B. But we know that these are much greater than these. So if I'm maximizing, um, I look at this and I say, really choose either of these two. It's going to be fine. I can't tell the difference between the two of them. If I'm minimizing, choose either of these two. Um, and this one that's sort of ambiguous in the middle, probably don't choose that one. So that's that post hoc test. 
puts those letters up there. And the beauty about a post hoc test is it does it without doing multiple comparisons. So it is much more powerful than the Bonferroni correction. So whenever possible, do these post hoc tests. And um, there's um, some downsides to this, which I'll talk about probably next time. Um, I think the only other thing I kind of want to mention um, this time, just because um, uh, you know it might be relevant when we're thinking about homeworks and all that, is that um, I, I do want to go through kind of the, the the math behind some of these ranking and selection ideas. But um, but I just want to sort of say, you know give you a hint that you know, of course all of this has been built into Arena and all of the tools you're using, so it can do all of these tests for you. You can ask it to minimize and maximize and whatever. And it will say, you know, these two scenarios are definitely better than this scenario, but I can't tell the difference between the two of them. It'll do all that for you. You just have to know how to use the tool and know what to ask it. So um, it can do comparisons. It can even do optimization where you can say, uh, just find the best parameter and you choose how to run the experiment. OptQuest will do that for you. So there's a lot of cool stuff that's already built into Arena and other tools that will simplify the burden on you. But you got to know about these tests and these issues ahead of time before you're kind of allowed to use them. All right, so with that, uh, let me give you your last attendance uh, exercise here. Um, and uh, any other questions, I'm happy to take after. So a uh, question I have for you is um, the, in a, uh, in the confidence intervals we've seen for relative comparison, the two sample confidence intervals, um, what is the hypothesis, or you can just give me a number, what is the hypothesis we are seeing if we're rejecting? So if I've got a confidence interval on X minus Y, and I wanna know is X different than Y, what is the numerical hypothesis that I'm trying to reject by looking at that confidence interval? So what number am I looking for, whether it's in the confidence interval or out? when I've got a two sample confidence interval. If I present a two sample confidence interval, I say this is the confidence interval on X minus Y. What number am I looking for, whether it's in that confidence interval or out of that confidence interval? That's all I've got for you. So I hope you have a good weekend. And again, if any other questions, feel free to come up. Remember, I think homework G3, I think it's availability window closes Saturday, I think. So look out for that if you haven't turned it in yet. Any questions online? Okay. In that case, I'll move to close the room.